Hi, um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about my small food company, which is called Canood. Uh, Canood means crop in Welsh. Um, I suppose I was always going to return home at some point. Um, my gran is a, a massive inspiration, really. Uh, when I used to talk to her, um, I suppose, about the war and about West Wales and rationing, and she always used to point out that that down here we never really had it that bad. The farmer, you could always trade. My grand's father was a fisherman, so they could always trade with the farmer for meat, or for butter, for milk, or for vegetables, or, or whatever, whatever need, really. Um, but, uh, I mean, most importantly, I just kind of knew that we were so... West Wales, or Carmarthenshire, Pembrokeshire, Ceredigion, so agriculturally rich. Um, we've got the sea on our backs, the rivers are full of fish, we've got the game estates, and they've got all this wonderful stuff. And I... And I suppose before I, before I went away, which I'll come to talk to you about in a minute, about my story, I, um, I just, you know, I just, I always felt like there was nobody really doing anything with it and no one was really singing about it and, and all the farmers and the gamekeepers and the fishermen, you know, they're all doing their, they're all doing their thing and um, in this pocket of the world and no one really knew about it. I mean, I suppose when it really dawned on me, I, uh, originally I took a, a kind of Savoy apprenticeship at 17, I went away and... Um, and it was a Saturday afternoon in the Barclay Hotel, and uh, and this big, huge fish arrived, and it was just, it was just plonked on the uh, on the fish counter, and the chefs were coming and going, and they were just walking past it, and you know, and and I knew exactly what it was. It was it was a sea trout or a suin, we call it suin, and um, and it was you know it was about this big, and I knew, I knew that that fish could have only have come from one part of the world, and that was that was what, of well, one part of the country, and that was West Wales, uh, because the three rivers that we have the. I suppose the Tyvee, the Tav, and the Tawi, they predominantly have the largest suin and sam, uh, salmon, you know, in, in Wales. So especially the suin and the sea trout uh, for these rivers. So I, I kind of, you know, I always wanted to kind of do something with that. Um, and then I suppose we set up, a couple of years ago I moved back and we set up Canood and with my partner, Kirsty, who's um, been absolutely brilliant because... You know, I'm terrible at you know all the business stuff. I just kind of, I just do what I want to do and do the stuff I love to do. And Kirsty picks up the pieces and pulls it all together. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just go back to my story. Really, I moved away. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, I'm, I moved away at Samdee, and I'd had a, very lucky enough to have a, an apprenticeship. Um, I was there for two years, and then I went to work for a guy called um, called Gordon Ramsay. Um, at the time, no one really knew about him. He it was like 1996. Uh, it was a small restaurant called the Aubergine. So I went there, spent a bit of time. I got kind of upset with him. We had a row. <laughs> this is a surprise, you know. <laughs> uh, so then I went to New York. Uh, I went to work with a guy called John George. And I suppose while I was out there, I was kind of inspired by their farmers' markets. They kind of slightly more advanced they were at the time, really. In, in, in that regards. Um, and then I moved back then and I went to work for a Japanese restaurant. After two years, I went to work at a Japanese restaurant called Nobu, um, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. Uh, what, the Jap I mean, what I wanted to take from that was the, the Japanese palate. I mean, I had a Western palate and obviously uh, the Japanese have a totally different palate. And what the Japanese don't know about fish just simply isn't, isn't worth with no end, really. Um, so f f I'll talk about that restaurant slightly. I mean, they stuck me straight on to the soup section. And by this time, I'd, I'd already worked in... I was a pretty accomplished cook. And they stuck me in the soup section, so my ego didn't really, didn't really like that, you know. Um, and I was on it for a month, and I couldn't get the miso soup or the akadashi soup right. And then I was on it for another month. You know, I was getting angrier and angrier and angrier. And a Japanese, every day, a Japanese member of staff would come off to come over, try the miso soup. You know, look down his nose at me, you know, as if to say, you know, and then just walk off. Um, and then eventually one day I got it right, because uh, my palate had changed, and, um, and I went around the kitchen there, and I really enjoyed it. I mean, what, like I said, they, what they, you know, the fish they used, they, already I'd worked in maybe three or four restaurants that always had fresh fish, but compa compared to what the Japanese were bringing in, this was a different, this was a different level. So having spent some time there, I kind of got, um, I got, uh, I said I got, I kind of got fed up of Asian food for a while, so I went back then, because I hadn't, I hadn't 
really stuck out the aubergine with Gordon. I kind of needed to go and prove it to myself, really. And Marco had the Mirabelle, and he was based there because he'd given back his three stars somewhere else, and he'd moved into the Mirabelle. So the wonderful thing about Marco was he shot his own game. He didn't do much work. He just shot his own game and drank expensive wine. <laughs> he, he drank a bottle of Chateau de Chem uh, in the office with an omelette Arnold Bennett once. It was like a £30,000 bottle of wine. So, um, so my, the wonderful thing was that he shot his own game. I learned the stocks and sauces, and he had a massive larder section uh, where we make pâtés and terrines. And then out the back then, I mean, he had four or five restaurants at the time, and out the back he had um, uh, like a, I suppose he's like a, he had a, we had a load of illegal Colombians working, uh, just pluck. <laughs> Yeah, it looked like a, it looked like a, it looked like a sweatshop, you know, uh, because what would happen is they'd be plucking the birds, you know, for a, pa a pound a bird, you know, and they, and they were really quick, just like ten of them in a line, and they'd have like a handkerchief round their, you know, round their, tied to their ears so they wouldn't breathe in the feathers. So you know, you'd look out the back and it'd look really, uh, really, really dodgy. <laughs> Um, but what I realised there, we made the patties and trains, and we sent them all off to Marco's different restaurants, and they were all very classical. Um, and I just, it, it, I, this is like 10 years ago, I think, you know, I was about 30, uh, I was about 20, 24, 25, and, um, and in my head it stuck there, there was a production line, there was this really high-end production line. Um, but the only thing was, I just, you know, I knew we could, I could possibly have done this in Wales, but our product was better, you know. I mean, his pork was coming from somewhere he didn't really care about at the time. And, um, and the fish were coming in, they were farm fish. And so, you know, I, I, it just stuck in my head, you know, as a constant. So, so, so then from there on then, I went to work at another restaurant and another one, another one. And eventually I came back to Wales. I worked in a couple of restaurants down here in, in West Wales and I wasn't working. And I kind of need to work for myself. When you've done so much, you really kind of feel like you need to, you know, you need to work for yourself. You have your own opinions and you know exactly, you know, I suppose how you want to express yourself. So, um... So we, we basically set up Canood, really. We had a lot of help from some pretty amazing people. Um, it took a long time. We had a grant. I mean, to get it to where we've got it to now, you know, it's not easy. Um, people said it couldn't be done because I decided I was going to buy the fish. I was going to smoke salmon and sewing from these rivers because, you know, they, the fish were big enough. Um, and another thing, another thing that stuck in my head was some places in Wales where, you know, they were flying in, bringing in Scottish fish, and then they were smoking it with French oak. And then they were calling it, uh, you know, Welsh smoked salmon, and and you know it just wasn't simply Welsh at all. Uh, so what I did was I set out. Uh, we went. I, you know, I built a relationship with the kind of coracle men who were a really kind of quirky parochial bunch. That you know they they sat me down. You know uh, they're quite conservative in the market, so I had to earn their respect. Even though my grandfather was a coracle man, they still you know they still weren't sure this guy who moved away and come back and. So they, you know, they said, you know, here's the rules. If you don't follow our rules, we won't sell anything to you. Um, and so the funny thing is, is you know, you're sitting around the table with all these coracle men who are kind of seasoned, weathered men, and they, you know, so he said, if you buy fish from Dai, uh, you can't tell Paul about it. <laughs> and we're all sitting around the table, and uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I couldn't figure, I couldn't figure, you know, I couldn't figure how it worked. So so it's just. So that, that's why, I mean, when I moved back, people say, no, you'll never buy, you know, there's not enough fish. And the fact of the matter, there's, there's quite a lot of fish there. They just, they just don't tell anyone what they caught, so no one knows. <laughs> um, but, I, you, know, we've, I, you know, we've got, an, I mean, every now and again, you know, I think some, the hard thing, I suppose, with working with those guys sometimes is the first two in of the season is a cherished, you know, is a cherished thing. Even from when I was a child, my father was an angler, and, you know, when suing or salmon came into season, it would be on the table, and you look forward to these things. Again, come back to my grandson about being closer to Earth. But, you know, the first, you know, we tweet about it. You know, the first soon in the season, we tweet about it. Or I'd tweet Richard Corrigan, do you want the first Cor And he'd say yes. And then all of a sudden, I'd get a, a phone call from one of the men saying, that picture's got to come down. <laughs> you know, that tweet's got to come off the site. And, you know, and I put it down. And, all right, okay, there we go. I got to, that's the, you know, that's the, that's the rules. Um, there, another, I mean... I think the realism, you know, with, with Canood, and you've got to stick, you know, you've got to stick to your guns. If you set out uh, to do something, and, and we, we use seasonal stuff, you know. So, for instance, it's re it, sometimes it's really hard when you're setting up a business and cash flow is a struggle. You know, if you've got a venison product that goes out of season, 
And, and what, the way you look at your product, the way we look at our products is kind of the venison brings in such and such, you know, that, the salmon brings in such and such. So they're big pockets of money. It's like 40,000, 30,000. It's part of your turnover, you know? And uh, to say goodbye to that 40,000 pound product, which brings you in when it's in season, is a really, a really hard thing because you could get more farmed venison in and carry on doing it all year round. But I didn't believe in that, you know? I just, you know, what's the point? But it's really hard. But the first, I mean, the balance is, is the, for instance, the venison goes out of season in February, well, actually goes out in April, uh, March, I think. But they're pregnant, so canoe doesn't really want to buy, buy, um, buy or shoot animals that are, you know, they're you know, shot when they're pregnant. So, and then when that comes out of season, fortunately for us, the salmon and seawind comes in. So then, by the time the salmon and seawind comes, is going out, the venison, we shoot the bucks, then the male venison again shot. So, so, um, you know, it's a balance. It's a real, it's a real balance. I mean, the mackerel was a really hard one last year. I, you know, I, I got told by the co uh, by fishermen, not coracle men, that we'd have mackerel in April, and what happened? It rained so much that the rivers, the rivers filled with water. Then the water filled the bays uh, full of cold water, which stopped the mackerel from coming in to spawn. So that meant the fishermen then had to go further out to catch the mackerel, and it, the, the fuel costs went up. Therefore, the mackerel went went up, and. Uh, and then nobody wanted to buy mackerel because they think it's a cheap product. So you can't charge a lot for it. So then the fisherman said, well, we're not going to fish for it. So I didn't have mackerel until, I suppose, till June, June, or, you know, June or July, really, which was um, what, not what, you know, that wasn't in the business plan, you know. So, um, uh, so you know, you have to learn and improvise and, you know, bring, th bring things through. Um, also, another hard one, I mean, we're stuck. Canood is stuck, really, between, I think, between the cottage industry and, and real, real industry. And we, we're constantly, constantly trying to, you know, trying to bridge, bridge that gap. I mean, buying the salmon and sewing from the Corrigan is, is not easy. I get seven or eight texts all the way through the night, you know, from, from 12 o'clock onwards, it's beep, 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 beep. And they're saying, I got fish, I got fish, I got fish. So the first thing at six, I get up, get in the van, I drive around and I pick them up. And I do that every day. Uh, and I have to do that because if I didn't do that, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have this smoked sewing, you know, or, or salmon. And, and, and those, you know, I've made those choices. It's not the easiest company to run, but I've made them, and I, and I enjoy it. I mean, the relationships that I've built with the, fa with the farmers, especially, and the fishermen, I mean, what I've learned from those guys is, um, you know, in the last couple of years is unbelievable. Um, I mean, for instance, pig, pig farmers are hard for me because you know, I want a sustainable source of pork that's, re you know, really, you know, really well bred, really well looked after. But the problem is pork is so cheap and pigs eat so much. So nobody really wants to do pigs on a large scale because there's no money in it, you know? So, um, I mean, that's been a hard one. The duck man is a really funny guy as well. <laughs> um, uh, he, didn't, he doesn't want to budge on anything. And being a chef, you're used to buying things and having them whenever you want it. Now, this isn't the case, you know? I mean, I, I wanted his duck. I could have got duck from somewhere else, but I wanted it so badly because it was so amazing that I just had to go with him, you know. Uh, he like he, I get a phone call uh, or a text message on, on a Saturday or Sunday uh, morning, and then um, he says, "You want duck for the weekend?" So the thing is, which I didn't know, you, ducks molt, so he has to pluck the ducks one day a week, because when they, because what happens is with the ducks, if he doesn't kill them and pluck them, uh, they they go through a cycle, and then they just look like fat porcupines, <laughs> and you can't pluck them, which I didn't know. So the duck man, again, we've had to evolve in a way, not having things when he wanted, working with those guys, you know? So, like, <laughs> like uh, I, I don't get, and, but we always have, you know, it's always fresh. He doesn't do frozen. I can't buy frozen, uh, you know, off him and ask him to stockpile it. He won't do it. So, you know, if a, like a, food, like a deli or s someone in London says, well, right, we need more pork red, we've got to ramp it up. I've got to wait till next week until I can ramp, ramp it up. But it's all right, people work with that and they really understand it. And, uh, and they, you know, they, I suppose they come in, you know, come in to, to love it really and understand, understand the story. Uh, I'm, you know, I mean, we've, like I said, relationships are really important. Working with the National Trust, they, um, we get all our venison from the National Trust. And I think I'd like to do more with, with, with those guys because, I mean, the venison that I get off them is, you know, it's incredible. Uh, it's well butchered, it's well hung. We're extremely, I mean, I suppose I'm extremely uh, lucky really. Um, another really, you know, important thing it, 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 with Canood is the provenance and the story, and making sure everything gets followed through. So every salmon or suin or venison, well, the salmon suin let's start with that we buy has a tag number on it. So the tag number um, can tell you who caught it, when they caught it, uh, what time they caught it, and what 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 tide they caught it on, and what river. So I mean, every 
you know, everyone comes through. So if you buy a salmon and a sewing from Canood, it'll come, it'll come with the tag number. And you know, if you went to the environment agents, you could type it in, see who caught it and when you caught it, when they caught it. Um, also, I work with the, uh, you know, we kind of work with communities as much as possible, really, because you've got to give back to them. Um, so, I mean, we work with the Celtic Sea Trout Project. Pro, uh, project. So every fish that comes in gets measured. Uh, I scale it. So the scale on the fish is like the bark of a tree. So I can tell you all about the, the sea trout. Because, um, and then the head, then they send, we send off to university and there's a year bone in there. We can tell you what it's eaten, how old it is. Well, you know, whatever they want to know, really. And the thing is with the sea trout, we don't really know, you know, we don't really know. What, all trout are born in the river. Some, we don't know what, what it is. Some stay in the river. The ones that stay in the river are brown trout. And the one, then some go west and go to the sea and they become sea trout. They become much bigger and larger. We think they only go as, they're not like the Atlantic salmon. We think they only go as far as the, the continental shelf um, uh, and live off, um, reach sexual maturity. And then they all come back to the, to the rivers that they were, um, they were born in. Um, there's a, I mean, with, with those, the, you know, there's a, whole, there's a whole raft of problems, I suppose. Uh, they, they're born in, 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 the, in our rivers, and then they come back, but the, government, kind of, the rivers have been dammed, so the, you know, the sea trout swim back, and they, you know, there's a big dam there, they don't know where they, you know, they kind of don't know where they're from, so we, you know, the kind of, the fish go up and down, really, on, on, on um, I suppose, on supply. Um, what else we got? I suppose the brand has been extremely important when you're building a little company. Um, what's really hard is, uh, I suppose in the beginning you want, you know, you wanted, you're trying to build the brand, so you want to keep it quite special. So pinpointing little towns and having it in just one place in that town it, and sticking to that is really hard because, you know, initially you, you've set up this company, you've borrowed all this money and you just need revenue to come in, but you've, you're still kind of building that brand and you still need to keep it quite special. So um, it, that's a really hard thing is, you know, picking the best place to put it in. And, and, and not over and not over kind of saturating saturating it straight straight away really um, sorry um, I suppose for, from my point of view being a chef and then to, I suppose becoming a businessman when you're in the I spend 16 kitchens uh, 16 hours a day in the kitchen and you don't have to do business things and and, and you know I suppose stepping out of that has been a massive learning curve for me really I suppose I've had to embrace my weaknesses um, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not very good at spelling, I'm not very good at maths, I can't read that well. So uh, it's really surrounding yourself with really, um, really great people is, is really important, really. Um, I suppose learning to manage people, not just in the kitchen, the kitchen's quite a harsh environment, so it, everybody tends to bark at each other. Um, and I think it's I'm just getting that balance, right, of, of, of having lots of thinkers and then, and I suppose, and then doers, you know. Um, I think originally, I, you know, I, in London, I, I suppose I, I filled the kitchen with, with lads and boys, and then there was too many egos, and I couldn't do anything with them. And then I kind of filled the kitchen with girls, and it was it was really nice and and tidy and and clean, and and they were much more organised and they were brilliant, but they were very bitchy. So um, <laughs> so then I had to manage that, and that was another headache for me, you know. So. Um, so then, I, I, you know, I realised that it was a, it was a, you know, it was a balance, uh, and 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 you got to get, you know, you got to get that right, uh, to to start with, you know, and um, I suppose coming, getting canoed right, and uh, I suppose, uh, you know, all these things are the balance. It's not just the food and and the image. It's the background. You know, it's having the good people, having the consistency. You know, when something's not quite right, you know, just no, it's not right. We can't sell it. You know, it's just not instead of going, all right, send it out. It'll be all right. Uh, you know, it's, it's been very grown up. I'm just, I'm, I'm not serving something that you, you know, you, um, not, you know, it's not serving something or putting, selling it to something and you know it's not right, you know, you've got it, no, it's not right. Put it, in, put it in the bin, get rid of it, I don't want to see it. You know, it might, you know, as long as it's hanging around, there's, you know, there's a chance that someone's going to sell that, <laughs> you know, so, um, uh, so you have to cover all corners, <laughs> uh, really. Um, I think that, uh, I, I suppose again, I'm learning about the financial struggles of the first year. I mean, I've got to buy all the salmon and sewing when it's in season. So all of a sudden, the season arrives last year, which I didn't, you know, I didn't think about buying it all. I don't know why I didn't think about it. So I had to buy like 30 or 40 thousand pounds worth of fish in one go. And we were a new company and, uh, and I had no money left, you know. So I came to, uh, 
We came to all. I said, I'm going to go bust. I'm going to go bust you, you know? Uh, so they were, you know, they were really important. You know, they've been massive learning curves for me, really. Uh, we had a, I, mean, I was really lucky. We had a, well, we had a, you know, how we did it financially, I suppose. I, uh, you know, we had a grant uh, from the Welsh Assembly. We, we were really lucky to get. Uh, then I had a really, really understanding investor. And then I, I took out a personal loan uh, because we ran out of money. And then I remortgaged. And then, um, and then I took some more money out. So, um, I mean, but the fine thing is now this year it all looks, you know, it's all looking much better. Our projections to the first, to this, for the first time ever, the first quarter is out of the way. We're bang on target, and that's, you know, that is a massive relief, um, and, and reward really for all the hard work that goes in, all the driving round and picking, picking stuff up. But you know, at six o'clock in the morning, or having to deal with the deck man or the pig farmer. <laughs> Uh, for the future for Canood, I think, I mean, this year there's going to be a couple of more products coming out. Uh, it's, uh, we've got, um, I got a mushroom guy over in, um, over in Glendisil. So we've got a wild mushroom, uh, there's an organic mushroom pate coming out. Uh, again, you know, he's going to be a funny one to deal with. Uh, <laughs> you know, we went up there to take, we went up there to take pictures, you know, because we wanted for the website and, you know, and, and to give the image. And, I wanted to have his little pot, because he starts with this pot of spores and then he, you know, he works it all the way up. And, um, and we were taking pictures of the stuff that I was buying and then we found these other spores, you know, in a little pot in the corner, you know, and uh, I was like, oh, that's not, what are they then? Let's have a look at that. So, uh, you know, we went to take a photo of that and he, you know, he just totally freaked out. And, uh, and uh, so, he, you know, he's obviously growing something he shouldn't be growing, you know. Uh, and well, I'm just coming to the end of my talk now, really. But for the yeah, for, uh, for the year coming, I, I'd like to bring out a, a like a buoy bears, um, like a fish soup, I suppose, a bycatch buoy bears because all the huss and conga and all these things they go in the lobster pot, they get caught in the nets, they get thrown back, and it's just waste, you know. And they can make a wonderful soup. So the, the so yeah, for the next year there'll be I, I hopefully you know that's the there'll be a few products, but especially the one I'm looking forward to is the the, by, the bycatch buoy bears. So. Yeah, so thanks very much, guys, for listening to me.